In one moment, the search for Gwen Moxon. Address unknown. Address unknown. Brought to you by Colgate Palmolive. Makers of Colgate Dental Cream, Palmolive Shaving Cream, Ajax the Foaming Cleanser, and Super Fab with Wonder White. And here again is Henry Simon. One of the strangest cases the Missing Persons Bureau ever handled started one afternoon in March 57. At the time, it was thought the winter was over, but a sudden cold snap brought out the gloves, the overcoats and mufflers. It so happened I wasn't busy on the afternoon in question, so I was able to see a client who hadn't made an appointment, who'd suddenly turned up at my office. Uh, What's that? Moxin. Yes, all right, send him in. My secretary ushered Clifford Moxon through the door and left him standing there just inside the room. He was small, about 50, dapper, and his eyes were very bright and alert. Peeping out from behind his turned-up raincoat collar, I could see a blue and white striped shirt with a collar of plain white. Uh, Good afternoon. Oh, come in, Mr. Moxon, come in. Come and sit down. Thank you. I've been trying to make up my mind for days whether to come and see you or not. And here you are. Yes, Oh, I'm so sorry. Your hands are cold. Let me pull this heater a little closer to your chair. Uh, Here we are. Thank you, Mr. Simon. I didn't realize it was so cold. Now then, uh, how can I help you? Actually, I've, um, I've been putting this thing off for far too long, now that I think about it. It's four months now. Four long months. My wife, Gwen, suddenly left me. I've been hoping she'd come back, but she hasn't. I want her back. She'd been threatening to leave me for years, and finally she went. I want to settle our differences, a reconciliation. She, uh, she's an impossible woman, but I find I can't live without her. Has she contacted you since she left? Not a word. I see. What was the date of your wife's departure from home? Um, November it was, the, uh, the 26th. She's never indulged in this sort of thing before? No, never. But she threatened to divorce me. Oh, on what grounds? Purely imaginary ones. I'm afraid my wife's very neurotic. Convinced I was carrying on with other women. She was always accusing me of it. Oh, go on, Mr. Moxon. She suffers terribly from anxiety and depression, out of all proportion. Oh, dear. She sounds like a very troubled woman. I'm very worried about her, Mr. Simon. Yes, I'm sure you are. But tell me, why did you leave it so long before seeking help? Well, I I told you, I hoped she might return. I've tried to find her, but eventually I realized, after turning the problem over and over in my mind, that I didn't have a chance of finding her without professional assistance. You've tried your wife's family? Oh, Gwen was an only child, and her parents are dead. Other relatives? No, there's none. I think that accounts for some of her insecurity. Did your wife work? She had a job, but it became too much for her, so she said... I think she lost interest. No, she stayed at home. And her friends? My wife kept herself very much to herself, Mr. Simon. She had no liking for or trust in anyone. What about Manny? What's she keeping herself on? Well, perhaps she's gone back to teaching. A teacher? Hmm. When she talked of leaving you on previous occasions, did she ever say where she'd go? No. And on this occasion, had you quarreled? Oh, yes. Very badly, I'm afraid. She was sulking with me when I went to work. I returned home in the evening, and she'd gone. Taking her things with her? Clothing and possessions, the lot. What about your neighbours? Did one of them see her leaving, perhaps? Well, I haven't been able to find anyone who saw her. I see. Uh, what's your address, Mr. Moxon? Paddington. Craven Hill, number 129. Paddington. I, uh, I brought this. Thank you. Mrs. Moxon? Yes. A very good photograph, really. Uh, you'll, uh... You'll let me have it back, won't you? Of course. After we find her for you. Thank you. <laughs> Where can we contact you during the day? Smithfield Meat Market, United Distributors. I am a foreman checker in the cooling sheds. After Clifford Moxon's departure, I tried to contact Agent Bob Hunter, but he was away in Scotland busy on another case. 
I had no alternative but to recall Agent Paul's study from his holiday, which I reluctantly did. A bit of a come down Madeira to Smithfield Meat Market. Still upset. Wouldn't you be? Ah, but forget it. I can go back when the job's finished. Now, come on, let's recap. Well, that won't take long, I'm afraid. The only concrete lead we've got is the photograph. Hmm. Markson must be nuts wanting a dame like this back again. She looks all right. Yeah, but you can't judge a book by its cover. Mm, how right you are. Now, the thing I'd plump for is the teaching angle. If that's what she knows, maybe she's taking it up again now that she has to support herself. Well, I'll handle that for you. The education authorities and the teachers' union. Now, watch yourself, Chief. Teachers are usually miss, you know. Maybe she's using her maiden name. Now, I'll get that from Markson. You know, he said that during his own checking, he hadn't come across a neighbor who saw her leaving. What do you think? And did he try more? He didn't say. Well, I'll go take a look-see. Perhaps Mr. Markson used the wrong approach. Craven Hill, Paddington, is the extension of Parade Street. The houses are in long four-story terraces, divided up into flats. Study checked first at 127 and 131, the houses on either side of Moxon's residence. The occupants had seen and heard nothing. Study decided to try 129, question the other tenants. Alan Brett was an out-of-work actor with rooms in the basement. Sorry the place is such a mess. Haven't been up long. Couldn't face traipsing round the agents this morning. I'm going to call at the Labour Exchange after lunch, get my card stamped. Oh, it's OK, don't apologise. Oh, sit down, if you can find somewhere to sit. Oh, just let me move the frying pan. No. There. Ah, uh, thanks. Now then, the Moxons. That's right. Uh, you know Mrs. Moxon has left her husband. I thought as much. Been some months now, hasn't it? That's right, November last year. Did you see her leave? No, I didn't, actually. But from all accounts, she was a real so-and-so. Gave the old chap a rough time, poor devil. Uh, did you know her? No, never met her. Used to hear them quarrelling, though. Terrible din. Then she waltzed out, and it's been quiet ever since. Uh, you don't mean to say Moxon wants her back? Well, that's a general idea. That's why we're looking for her. He must be balmy. Doesn't know when he's well off. Yeah. Love's a funny thing. You say you never met her. That's right. Not that I'm sorry. Never introduced, that's all. Never had occasion to be. But you saw her. Oh, yes. Coming and going. I can see them all from this window here. Okay, Mr. Brett, I'll be shoving off. Sorry I wasn't able to be of more help. Oh, that's okay. Just have to try somewhere else. But I don't know where. Now, what about the other people in the house? You shouldn't think they'll be able to tell you any more than I have. You see, they haven't been here long before Mrs. Moxon left him. Oh? How long? A few days, that's all. Well, just long enough for people to notice what a vixen she was, huh? Well, you know how nosy some people are. Actually, I got the whole story from Mrs. Cowie on the third. An old busybody, if ever there was one. I suppose everybody's glad Mrs. Markson went. Well, it's a lot quieter, and we feel the old boy is better without her. I see. Well, I guess I'll gallop up to the third floor and see this Mrs. Cowie. Thanks, Mr. Brett. Pleasure. Oh, um, if you hear of any stage work, you might remember me. Well, we don't mix very much in theatrical circles, but uh, from time to time we find ourselves confronted with some pantomimes. <laughs> Study consulted Mrs. Cowie and learned nothing more than Alan Brett had already told him. He was very despondent when he returned to my office. Something else to add to your worries. I checked with Mr. Moxon about his wife's maiden name and in turn checked the education people. She's not working as a teacher and hasn't done so for about five years. Uh, you think it's worth trying the Moxon's old address? You haven't got much choice, have you? It's a natural follow-up. Well, can I use your phone, Chief? Phone Moxon? I wouldn't do that if I were you. He's probably not in the office. He wasn't when I phoned. They had to fetch him from the sheds. Go over there, you've got time. Smithfield Market, the site of the famous Bartholomew Fair, is today a great meat exchange serving the whole of the British Isles. One of the biggest agencies is United Distributors. Study had no difficulty in finding them, but then he had to find our client. Study wended his way among meat carcasses, porters, refrigerated trucks, and eventually found Mr. Moxon supervising the checking of a large consignment of meat which had arrived from Australia. In a large cooling shed, it was. Even colder in here than outside, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good job I brought my overcoat. How do you work in here? Oh, this is nothing. It's even worse in the cold storage. 32 degrees of frost. But fortunately, we don't work in there very often. Now then, Mr. Study, any luck? No, not yet, I'm afraid. The reason I came to see you was to ask you for your old address, the place you lived before you moved to Paddington. Oh, I don't see how that'll help. Well, I thought maybe some of your old neighbors have seen her recently. No, I'm afraid not. 
We were in Earl's Court before, but I've been there myself. No one's seen her. Oh, dear. Another cul-de-sac, huh? What will you do now? Well, frankly, Mr. Markson, I don't know. I just don't know. And I don't know either. There's just nowhere to turn. Well, she's got to be somewhere. I checked with the passport office while you were out. She doesn't have a passport, so she can't have left the country. That figures. Not enough money. I wonder, what if she's suffering from amnesia? Oh, great. That's all we need. A neurotic woman who's lost her memory. If you follow this up, you know what it means, don't you? Yeah, blisters. Hospitals, sanatoria. It wouldn't take long on the phone. I'll get one of the girls to do it. And if we draw a blank? Oh, just a minute. About Mrs. Moxon, it's just occurred to me that she may be suffering from amnesia. You may have been found wandering somewhere. Check with the police and the health authorities, will you? All right. What were you saying just now? I asked what would we do if we drew a blank there. Well, we have no other leads to follow. We'll have to resort to advertising, at Mr. Moxon's expense, of course. Personal columns of the national papers? That's right. My secretary's queries to the police and hospitals did draw a blank. So, without further ado, I drew up an advertisement which was inserted in the major daily newspapers. During the five days which elapsed, study checked everything, not once, but many times. We were sitting in my office, looking very dejected. Study complaining about the holiday he'd abandoned. And here I am, cold and frustrated. Nothing. Nothing to show for more than a week's work. If that's another client, tell him we're close for the season. I have a Mrs. Wells on the line. She says it's in connection with your advertisement about Mrs. Moxon. Put her through. An answer to our advert. A Mrs. Wells mean anything to you? Not a thing. You're through? Hello? Mr. Simon? Speaking. I gather that you're looking for Mrs. Gwen Moxon. Yes. Who engaged you to look for her? Her husband. I see. Do you know where she is? I'm afraid not, but I think I should explain who I am. The Moxons consulted me, at least Mrs. Moxon did. I'm a psychologist specializing in marriage guidance. Yes, I understand their marriage wasn't particularly happy, but I fail to see why it was Mrs. Moxon who came to you. Wasn't it the other way about? Wasn't she the trouble? Far from it, Mr. Simon. Far from it. Henry Simon returns to continue the story in just a moment. You are listening to Address Unknown, presented by Colgate Palmolive. I wondered what on earth was coming next. I thought for a moment that Mrs. Wells and I were talking at cross-purposes. But she went on to explain... Mrs. Moxon came to the Marriage Guidance Bureau. Oh, it'll be nearly five months ago. She was terribly upset when she came to see me. She explained how she and her husband quarrelled all the time. Told me what they quarrelled about. There were all sorts of things. Mr. Moxon went on spending sprees far beyond his means. He was given to outbursts of temper. He lost interest in his job and his wife... And he had delusions that people were persecuting him. As you can imagine, all these things led to a very unhappy state of affairs in the Moxons' marriage. Mrs. Moxon was very wise in coming to see us. She took the right step. This is very disturbing, Mrs. Wells, because when Mr. Moxon came to see me, he gave me the impression that his wife was all those things. Please go on. I managed to get Mrs. Moxon's husband along to see me. He was very reluctant to come, and he made it clear that he thought my counselling was a waste of time. I realized that Mr. Moxon was very disturbed mentally. Neurotic? I'm afraid not. Something far more serious. He's a psychotic. I don't know much about this sort of thing, but isn't psychosis a severe form of mental illness? Yes, it is. And unfortunately, even the families of psychotic sufferers don't always recognize the signs of the illness until something serious has happened. What brought about Mrs. Moxon's visit to us was the fact that her husband had refused to eat any food that she prepared. Good gracious, why was that? He accused her of trying to poison him. It was then that she realized there was something radically wrong. What happened as a result of Moxon's visit to you? Well, from my consultation, I knew that Clifford Moxon was in need of psychiatric help. I referred him to a psychiatrist who was a specialist in the field of marriage guidance. I think you'd better contact him. Yes, I think we'd better. Where are his rooms? 200A Baker Street. And his name is Dr. Adams. 
Mrs. Wells, I'm very grateful to you. Shall we let you know what transpires? No, that won't be necessary, Mr. Simon. Dr. Adams will do that. It's lucky I saw your advertisement. It is indeed. Study raised his eyebrows questioningly at me. So I told him the whole story. It was a strange turn of events, and it was to get much stranger. Study hurried along to Baker Street, having made an appointment to see Dr. Adams. Oh, what's all this about, Mr. Study? Well, that's what I'm hoping to hear from you. What can you tell me about Clifford Moxon? Do you know where he is? Yes, but I'm looking for his wife. He asked the Missing Persons Bureau to find her. She left him four months ago in November last year. You're sure you know where he is? I'm sure, I'm sure. What gives with Moxon? Is he sick? He's very sick. He's a case of paranoid schizophrenia. He's what? It's a form of psychosis, Mr. Study. Very involved. Suffice it to say that Clifford Moxon had some very unhappy childhood experiences. And it's only now, now that Clifford Moxon has to face the fact that he's approaching old age, losing his vigor and so on, that his childhood difficulties have taken their toll. I see. Uh, but if what you say is true, uh, and I'm sure it is, how come Moxon told us that his wife's sick? Mr. Well, Study, Moxon's case is very complicated. So complicated that I started an analysis. A lengthy business which involves digging into the patient's subconscious mind to bring the real causes of his neurosis to the surface and in this way rid himself of the damage. Analysis can be called an attempt, a major attempt to reconstruct the patient's personality and patterns of behavior. Moxon came to see me only three times. He was negative. Negative? Yes. That's to say he resisted the analysis, took some of his hatreds and animosities out on me. That's not unusual. In fact, it's a necessary part of the analysis. However, not wishing to get too technical, suffice it to say that I found Moxon lacking in conscience, honesty, and a sense of responsibility. Uh, where's he working now? The Smithfield Market. Doing what? Well, he's a foreman checker in the sheds. Oh, dear. He hasn't worked there long. Did you know that? No, no, I didn't. Uh, what did he do before, and when did he change his job? Markson was the manager of a branch of Shentall Supermarkets, not far from Gloucester Road. He lost interest. That's in keeping with his illness. And he left Shentall's at the same time they moved from Earl's Cot. I lost track of them then. I did my best to find them, realizing that Moxon was possibly a psychopath, capable of committing antisocial and even criminal acts. I realized that Moxon's condition was too severe for me to handle once a week at 50-minute sessions on my couch. Just before I lost track of the Moxons, I suggested to Moxon himself that he should become a voluntary inpatient at a sanatorium, where he would have received more intensive treatment and where he'd be unable to get into mischief. And uh, what happened when you suggested that? He ran away, and I haven't seen either him or his wife since. Mm. Well, there's no wonder Mrs. Moxon left him. She's probably terrified of him. Yes. Yes, she probably is. Well, what do you mean by that, and where are you going? With you. Oh, let me get into my coat. There, come on. Uh, do you mind telling me where we're going? You know where Moxon is, right? Right. Well, he has to be taken to a place of safety. And you and I are going to do it. But what about Mrs. Markson? At the moment, she's of secondary importance. Perhaps once she hears that her husband can't do her any harm, she'll come out of hiding. Hey, now, wait a minute, Doc. If I turn up there with you, Markson will know that I know the truth. Oh, yes. That's right. Oh, but I can handle him. I hope you realize what you're up against. I'd better come anyway. I'll keep out of sight until he's been apprehended. And so it was, the two men set off for Smithfield Market. It was getting on for five o'clock, and Study was worrying about the fact that Mox and May have already left work for home. He fretted about the rush hour traffic which was holding them up. On the way, Dr. Adams mentioned another symptom of mental illness, compulsion. It's an action that a person is driven to perform again and again. It may be something like washing his hands all the time. Yeah, go on. If a neurotic person is prevented from carrying out his particular compulsive act, this leads to discomfort. In serious cases, the discomfort may border on panic, even tears and extreme agitation. Well, I'm getting pretty agitated myself about this traffic, but it's not compulsion. Yeah. 
Eventually, having crossed the heart of the city, Study and Dr. Adams arrived outside United Distributors at Smithfield Market. The place was practically deserted. Study inquired at the office for Moxon, and again he was directed to the cooling sheds. Adams accompanied Study part of the way, and then, as they'd planned, he let Study go on alone, while he himself kept out of sight. 43, 44, 45, 46, 46 March, 47, 48, 49, 50. 50, yes? Oh, hello, Mr. Study. Any luck? Uh, yes, I think we're getting somewhere. Oh, good, good. Um, you seem to feel the cold pretty badly. And what's the matter? You got poor circulation in your hands? Uh, no, no. Habit, I suppose? Yeah, I suppose so. Or compulsion. What's that? I said you should keep your gloves on. Have you finished here? Yes, I'm just about to pack up. You feel like taking a little ride? Where to? Oh, just back to the office. Mr. Simon wants to see you. What about? Well, we're not having much progress in finding your wife, Mr. Markson. Well, now you've told me there's not much point in my going to the office, is there? Well, aren't you upset about us not being able to find your wife? I'm sure you've done your best, Mr. Study. Well, that doesn't answer my question, and stop doing that. What are you doing? Let go of my hands. Why, Mr. Uh, like... Markson, does it bother you, me holding uh, your hands like this? Let me go. Oh, no, you don't. You just want to rub them together again, don't you? Please let go of my hand. You're, you're hurting me, do you hear? You're hurting me. Please, you must let me go. Or else oh, what? Oh, oh. You're coming with me, Mr. No, Markson. No, please don't take me away. I can't go. I... Got to look after Gwen. Well, what do you mean by that? My wife, you fool. My wife needs me. Well, where is she? <laughs> Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams. What on earth's happened? It's all right. I've got him. Look, I'm not hurting him. Listen to me, Moxon. We're taking you away to a nice place. Now, wait a minute, Dr. Adams. I've got a feeling we're about to hear a confession. A confession? Yeah. Ask him about his wife. Go on, ask him where she is. Listen, Moxon. Where's Gwen? Gwen? Yes. Where is she? Gwen. Don't! Where is she, Clifford? Sleeping. Yes. But where? Cold, bitterly cold, 32 degrees of frost. Oh, no. Dear heaven, no. Do you know what he means? Yes, I'm afraid I do. 32 degrees of frost. He mentioned that the last time I came here to see him. I think we'll find Mrs. Moxon in cold storage. Henry Simon returns to conclude the story in just a moment. You are listening to Address Unknown, brought to you by Colgate Palmolive, makers of Colgate Dental Cream, Palmolive Soap, Ajax the Foaming Cleanser, and Super Fab with Wonder White. And here again is Henry Simon. As I told you, it was one of the strangest cases we've ever handled. Between them, Study and Dr. Adams led Moxon away. They returned later with the police. The great cold storage chamber was opened up, and the body of Gwen Moxon was found buried in the ice on the floor. That was where Clifford Moxon's compulsion came from. His hands were cold from digging in the ice. He felt compelled to chafe them together to warm himself. He was so disturbed and convinced that his wife couldn't be found that, compulsively, he consulted us. And now, as always, this is Henry Simon inviting you to meet me here again, and, for the present, bidding you... Au revoir. Colgate Palmolive invites you to listen next Friday evening at 8 o'clock when Henry Simon will introduce another story in their gripping and unusual series, Address Unknown. <laughs>